Hey everyone, this is Local A-List, Tulsa's premier podcast, where we're going to be interviewing top performers here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm Stephen Morales. And I'm James Pesh. And enjoy the show. Do we want to say anything else? I think that's it. Hey everybody, welcome back to Local A-List. I am here with Dr. John from Zova Chiropractor. Now we've had... uh, uh, Dr. Mike on before, but we haven't had Dr. John on. So thank you so much for doing this for us. It, w- it was actually hard to get this scheduled because we had <laughs> things that were kept coming up that we were trying to get done. Uh, just meeting you today. James had some family stuff that kind of popped up last minute, and we've been trying to get this going for what three or four weeks now. So, so it's like we have like to that. get this. <laughs> we have to get this done. So welcome to the podcast, man. Uh, for people that don't know you, quick intro: who you are. I mean, obviously you're a chiropractor, but kind of the path and how you became a chiropractor and all that. Quick background story for everybody. Well, so basically I was born and raised here in Tulsa. Uh, My dad's a chiropractor, so I've grown up, you know, with chiropractic in my family, receiving chiropractic care my whole life. What's the name of that business? Uh, He owns Keith, it's called Keith Clinic. Where's that at? It's at 51st and Memorial. He's what's called a chiropractic internist. Okay. So he treats a lot of internal disorders. He's sort of like a naturopath mixed with a chiropractor. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so basically, you know, I received that care all my life, grew up here in Tulsa, uh, played soccer a lot, and actually in college, I was considering going into physical therapy or chiropractic. I wasn't sure which one. Um, And I tore my ACL playing indoor soccer. Um, And so I went and saw my dad and, you know, a lot of the care that he did, it was sort of, you know, traditional chiropractic care, mainly just adjusting the spine. Uh, And I wasn't just, I just wasn't getting the results I needed for my knee after I had surgery. Um, So that kind of led me to look into some other techniques. I went and got like some active release, some soft tissue work done. And then I actually went and saw Dr. Mike as a patient before I ever went to chiropractic school. I did not (laughs) know that. Yeah. So I was a patient there and kind of saw how he used, you know, chiropractic adjustments along with soft tissue work and exercise. And so then when I started chiropractic school about two years after that, That was kind of what I was really interested in, was focusing kind of on chiropractic, but with adding soft tissue work and rehab as well. So how long does it take to go through chiropractic school? So most of the schools, what they do is they do a trimester system. So you go year round, and it's usually about 10 trimesters. So the school I went to was 10 trimesters, so it's basically three full calendar years plus a third of a year. Gotcha. And then while I was there, I also got a master's degree at the same time. So, what? Yeah, I got, we did. It, what? They had a concurrent program, and they had a master's in nutrition and human performance. So I That's was kind crazy. of interested in that. So I did not know you had that, man. Yep, yep. So it that took you know about an extra four to six months because there was a little bit of an internship that I did with that. So, like since since you're doing that, do they give them as like credit hours? Like, hey, you're taking twelve credit hours this quarter. Yeah, no, yeah, they, it's credit hours, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But I just it's got to be more intense, right? It was something that. like thirty-one credit hours a semester. Like it was what? insane. How is, dude, like, <laughs> I mean, twelve is a full workload for people that don't know potentially, but. Like, people take, like, 16 or 18, and they're like, this is burying me. Yep. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was uh, classes started at 7.20 in the morning and usually got done at about 4 o'clock. And that was, you know, class Straight, after yeah, class yeah, after yeah. class. And then all the homework you have to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I had to really quickly learn how to uh, have a little bit of discipline and study yeah, groups. Yeah, no joke. All that stuff. So, it was pretty intense. So when did you graduate? So I graduated April of 2013. 13, okay. So, and then did you go straight to working with Dr. Mike mm-hmm. or? Okay. Yeah, so after I graduated with my chiropractic degree, I was still finishing the master's. Yeah. Um, so I did a little internship up in St. Louis at a, it was like a personal training gym that also had a chiropractic clinic inside okay. of it. Um, So I did that for about six months, and then when we moved back, you know, I think it was maybe two months later is when I started with Zova. Why St. Louis? Um, So I had originally, originally I was actually going to go to Kansas City. There's a school called Cleveland in Kansas City. Um, But then St. Louis, I was really interested. They they had a, a, a sports school. It was like a sports rehab master's degree. Okay. Um, and so that really interested me. But then when I got there, it turned out to not be quite everything I wanted it, it to be. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so I could just kind of got that training through outside seminars and yeah, stuff yeah. instead of that. 
So you, but the school is named Cleveland in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, it used to be Kansas City, Missouri. Now it's Kansas City, Kansas. Okay. Um, and I went to Logan in St. Louis. Gotcha. I was yeah. just thinking that's so many like names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cleveland in Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So then you come back here. You just hit up Dr. Mike. Or you kind of had been going to him the whole time. Well, or? actually, um, you know, I had just kind of kept in touch with him while yeah. I was in school. Uh, you know, just as like a mentor kind of a thing, asking him questions about like what techniques would be good to learn. Yeah. Um, you know, and we would have like assignments sometimes where we had to contact practicing docs and get information from them. And he was always real helpful with that. Yeah. Um, and then just like, you know, a couple of months before I graduated, I was, you know, looking at jobs, looking at different, you know, options. And then he shot me an email and he said, hey, what are you doing after you, yeah, <laughs> after yeah, you graduate? Yeah, and yeah. I was like, well, why do you ask? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just and so, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then, you know, we got to talking and we ended up working together. So you've been there how long now? So, I think almost four years. Going on four? Yeah, so I think in October it'll be four, so we're like at like three and a half right now. Were you at the Broken Arrow spot? Uh-huh. Okay, so yep. you were there and then switched over to the new one at 91st yep. and Yale. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, has there been a, a difference in, or, or any adjustments that you guys have had to make with the transition from Broken Arrow to that location at all? No, n- not a whole lot as far as, well, I mean... Maybe good adjustments we've had, you know, I think yeah, yeah. I think one of the most the interesting things is, you know, where we were before there wasn't really a lot of foot traffic. You yeah. know, so that made kind of marketing a lot more. You you know, that was kind of the only way people would hear about you. Yeah. Um, and one thing that's kind of nice now is we'll have people, you know, and they'll come in for their first visit and I'll be like, how'd you hear about us? And they'll say, oh, I was eating at Yokozuna and, yeah, and I saw, saw you, you. Guys. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. that definitely makes it, uh, yeah, it's kind of nice. It's a nice little was, perk. Was it the same setup with the equipment and all that that you have now or no? No. So that was actually a lot different. So at the old clinic, we did like an open adjusting area. So it was all just like one big room. And okay. Then Almost have, like a physical therapy office. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we had like little dividers to kind of give us a little bit of privacy when yeah. we were adjusting people. And then there was kind of the open rehab area. So this area, this new location definitely has a lot more equipment, a lot better rehab equipment. You know, got the nice kind of rubber gym floors, some yeah. pull-up bars. All you guys kinds have packed a lot of equipment in there too. Yeah. A lot of unique stuff. Uh-huh. I was looking at the uh, on it kettlebells because you guys oh, actually yeah. have like the gorilla ones and all that too <laughs> that are really really cool. Yeah, that was that was Doctor Mike. He had to have. The he had to have that one. one. I want the. Uh, they have the Iron Man one. Oh, I've never seen they, that. <laughs> it's, it's the Iron Man helmet, and I don't know why because it's not practical. But I'm like, <laughs> I want that. Like, but they always overcharge for those things, yeah. man. It's insane. Like 182 dollars for like a wow. 25 pound kettlebell. I'm like, mm, I can get that for 30 dollars yeah. off of Amazon. <laughs> so since leaving school, since you've been doing this now for a while. How has your practice kind of changed? And and, because once you're out, now you can mold it to whatever you do that in school, but now you actually get to kind of mold it into what you want. How has it kind of transitioned and changed over this last four years? So I would say kind of the biggest, the biggest change that I've had was so after I had my knee surgery, uh, I was I had a, a hamstring graft for my ACL instead of the okay. patellar graft. Yeah, and I had really bad problems with my hamstring afterwards. Like I couldn't even get close to putting my heel to my butt. Yeah, you know I had and my hamstring would cramp up every time I even bent it past ninety degrees. Um, and I went and had ART done for the first time, and that you know within like two sessions I was you know ninety five percent better. Yeah. And so when I was in school, I was like, I definitely want to learn that technique. So yeah. ART for people that don't know, it's basically like a really kind of deep soft tissue release technique as a, yeah. a way to kind of loosen up muscles that are tight, break up scar tissue, things like that. Um, so when I first got out, I was kind of like a big, like ART, you know, that was what I did on everybody. Yeah. Um, but you know, I kind of noticed like I would, somebody would come in with a tight shoulder and, you know, I would do ART, we'd restore a hundred percent range of motion and I'd think my job was done. And then they'd come back the next visit and, you know, they had, they were right back where right they back were the first started. day. Yeah, yeah. And so that was when I really kind of started to 
appreciate that, you know, that's only part of the story. And yeah. so that was where I kind of realized that, you know, the better you are at adjusting and rehab, the less work you have to do with all the soft tissues. So yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. say a big thing that I've kind of been, that my practice has kind of changed is kind of learning that if you teach someone how to activate, you know, their muscles that aren't activating properly, you have to do way less soft tissue work because yeah, those they're muscles correct just the kind underlying of underlying yeah, problem. Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I actually, I mean, I send a lot of people over to you just because, I mean, you do the, the muscle testing and all of that to an extent that, and I think me and you talked about up till recently, like, because I just haven't felt comfortable with it, is I do it with the medical exercise stuff, but we didn't cover it because it's hard. You, like when we, when I'd have the shadow, you go and you see it, but I can't touch their patient. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, okay. And then like to go and just repeat it on my client, I'm like, I'd make, I don't know, dude, I can't just watch a video and do that. I need somebody yeah. to kind of put me through it a little bit. Uh, but I send people over you cause I'm like, go to him. He can muscle test you. He can tell you what's wrong and I'm not going to put my hands on you. And then I'm wrong. Cause I don't know. I don't yeah. have to practice with it, which I think, um, you don't see with the traditional, chiropractor and I kind of wanted to talk about the notion of that because I've gone I threw up my back last July Mm -hmm. and this is when I started going to you on a regular basis um threw up my back called Dr. Mike and I was like I can't move I'm literally tilted (laughs) to the right I couldn't straighten my body all the way up he's like hey man I'm in Ireland (laughs) he's like but I'm gonna send you to Dr. John so you came in on a I think it was a Sunday dude you hooked me up you literally spent like an hour and a half with me I left standing upright and uh my back was like that because as soon as I threw it out I went to my old chiropractor Mm -hmm. and um I went in but he's a traditional guy and he puts me on the table and he adjusted me and I left worse yeah and I was like, oh, like it was more painful. And he's like, all right, come back tomorrow. We'll get you going again. Da, da, da. And I was like, I don't know if this is like, <laughs> like the spine, dude. This feels like my muscles. Yeah. And he's like, oh, and we've talked about it, me and me and like that chiropractor before. There's this weird, like they're resistant to ART and to muscle testing and to soft tissue work and teaching the the. Uh, rehab type movements and all of that. Do you catch that a lot? Do you meet a lot? Like where there's just that budding of heads with that kind yeah. of older school chiropractor? No, absolutely. So, you know, kind of the the original kind of theory behind chiropractic was, uh, you know, that basically all problems come from the spine. Um, so it was kind of thought that, you know, if you have a tight muscle, if you have you know, any kind of problem in the body that the source of that is coming from the spine. So it kind of started as a, you know, all you do is adjust the spine and let the, you know, let the body fix itself. And except the only thing is, is as we've gone along and we've done research, you know, time after time, you know, every time you put, you know, adjusting only soft tissue work and then adjusting and soft tissue work together, you know, no, the the very best outcomes come when you mix those Combine two. Yeah. yeah. So you can't just do the soft tissue work yep. and you can't right. just do the joint manipulations. The key is to do both of them together. Now the problem is that takes more time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which means you can't, you know, pump as many patients through. And I oh, think man, that that's yeah, I've why. Seen, I've seen. Uh, so I went to one guy. He had like three or four rooms lined up, and it was just ping, ping, ping. He was only in there five minutes, quick yeah. adjustment, and then he was out. And yeah. it was how many people they could get going through it. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, that's got to be a crazy schedule. Like, yep. and what if you're wrong? Like, what if you come <laughs> exactly. in there like, all right, we're gonna do this real quick? That's not enough time, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and with some of that, when you're talking about the, uh, especially like kind of the notion of soft tissue. When you explain that to somebody and what that manipulation is, and, and I think fascia is more of a common term now, how, how would, what's your explanation? How do you break that down? And especially for somebody that may be listening, they're like, I have no idea what that is. Are you talking about like the... What is the fascia? And when you give the term soft tissue work, what are you kind of talking about with that? Okay, gotcha. Um, Yeah, so basically when I, you know, soft tissue work is any work that's directed at your muscles, your ligaments, uh, the fascia, or the tendons. So, you know, basically what, what what they know is after an injury... 
what happens is your muscles, they tend to go become what they call hypertonic, which is basically they increase their tone. They kind of stay in a contracted state. Yeah. Um, it's kind of our body's way of creating a cast for the area, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's good for a time. There's a certain amount of time where that should happen. Um, but then what happens is that sticks around. You know, it's kind of like if you started limping after you sprained an ankle, but then you just kept limping for six months, right? <laughs> yeah. So eventually that starts co- causing problems. Uh, so then what we do is we use a lot of different techniques. You know, like I said, like ART. We use like instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization or GRAST. And it's basically the goal is... To, you know, it, it can either be a muscle that's just like overactive and yeah. we want to kind of like calm it down and do more of a like a relaxing effect. You know, sometimes if you've had surgery or something like that, you can have like just scar tissue that's not allowing a muscle to lengthen to its fullest yeah. potential. So that's where something like ART or something like that can really help to kind of restore that range of motion, break up the scar tissue. But basically, you know, most of the time soft, soft tissue work is going to be aimed at improving the function of your muscles and the extensibility of the tissue that's not bone, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the quickest term that I'll just throw out is like, especially when people are, I'm having clients do it, it's like, dude, it's kind of like a self-massage. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. that's what you're going to be doing. <laughs> uh, and I use this, and, and I'll get confirmation on you, this is just kind of what I've constructed with in my head with it, which it's that notion of throwing out your back. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it depends on the context of it, whether or not you've actually like ruptured or slipped a disc or something like that. I was like, but for your average person that just like, oh, when their back gets thrown out, I was like, you've most likely put too much pressure on the spinal cord as it's exiting out of the spine, right? And then the muscle or the back picks up on that. And then the muscles lock around that. And they're like, nope, because it doesn't want you to sever your spine, right? If you do yeah. something too extreme, you cut, now you're paralyzed, right? <laughs> so the body like literally locks it down. Is that, I mean, am I right in that assumption with that to an extent? No, like, yeah. I mean, that that's pretty much it. Like most of the time, like any sort of, you know, like the hot low back, like the, yeah. like you just did something, maybe you heard a pop or maybe like all of a sudden your back just started hurting very severely. Most of the time, what you've done, the most common thing is in a flexed position. So you bent forward too much from your low back. You stretched your muscles around the spine, maybe even the ligaments around the spine, and maybe even the discs past their their tolerance point basically and you you know maybe cause some little micro tears you know like strains in the muscle and you know little micro sprains in the ligaments and so you know that's usually what it is is you you basically i mean it's just like pulling a hamstring but you pulled it in your back yeah the body just (laughs) except except around your spine you know instead of just the like you know your hamstring is really the only thing in your leg back there when you yeah. pull it. But with your spine, whenever you pull that, there's ligaments, there's the discs. Yeah. And, and so you normally actually injure all of them at the same time. And then that's where like that tightness comes from. Like I was talking about before, your muscles will stiffen up and create, create like that a cast. splinting effect yeah. as a way to kind of mitigate any further damage. And then you guys are basically trying to tell the muscles like calm down, you're cool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're okay. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. what we're doing is, you know, when when all that happens, what you do is you lose the extensibility of the muscles, you lose the movement in the joints. And then, you know, that can cause, you know, blood flow restrictions that can cause all kinds of stuff. So our goal is to get the joints moving again, get the muscles loosened up so that everything can start to work the way it's yeah. supposed to. Uh, you can't obviously say names or anything like that, but can you kind of give like, who's the worst person that's come in and you've been like, whoa, like that's extreme, whatever they have going on. Cause I'm assuming you get some people that have some gnarly injuries that come to you. What's just one that pops out real quick. That's like, that was probably, they had these things going on. That's kind of super crazy. Um, you know, I, I would say the most, probably the most common thing is going to be like pinched nerves, basically, yeah. you know, I've had some people come in with, you know, starting to lose some function in their legs, you know, complete numbness really? shooting down. Um, do they, then they regain typically all of that back? Yeah. 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 Well, most of the time. So, uh, you know, I would say I haven't yet had to have a a lumbar disc or a cervical disc have to yeah. go to surgery yet. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we've been able to help them all with conservative care. Okay. Um, so yeah, we normally get them, you know, as close to a hundred percent as we can, you know, usually yeah. 80 to 90%. Yeah. 
Um, and then I would say other than that, just, you know, maybe like just some freak joint occurrences. Like yeah. I've had a couple people come in and like all of a sudden their knee won't bend <laughs> and they have no idea what they did. Really? Um, so, you know, you kind of do some freestyling and, <laughs> and eventually <laughs> you find it. And what's mo- going on. most of them we've been able to get them, you know, I had one guy come in and he has no idea what he did. He can't bend his knee. It was horribly painful. And yeah. so we just kind of went through, did some soft tissue work, did some joint work, kind of coaxed it, you know, little by little, and we got him to full range of motion that visit. That's so, awesome. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. No, I'd say uh, me coming in with me, because I've thrown on my back a handful of times, man, and that was the first one. It wasn't the worst. The worst one, my my muscles were flexing around the nerve, mm-hmm. and it was coming in waves. So every time I do that, it contracted and it holds so tight, it felt like my back was trying to break itself, and I yeah. couldn't breathe. Um, and that did that for five minutes. I was in so much pain. I couldn't lift my leg up. Mm-hmm. This one, I was stuck. That's the first time I've ever been stuck to one side. I was like, I, like, I can't straighten out at all, right? Uh, it's a gnarly, gnarly sensation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think what's really interesting is – you know, like I remember I treated a kid who was in like his, you know, early 20s. But I, yeah, he had thrown his back out. And I just remember him looking at me. He got real serious and he was like, this is the closest thing to a medical emergency I've ever experienced. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you know, the, even though, you know, I always try to tell people it's not that severe just so yeah. that, you know, so they don't freak yeah. out about it. But yeah, it's usually one of those situations where like the pain you feel is grossly over you know more than the actual the damage is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah just because yeah where i mean there's so many nerves yeah in it area. just lights up a ton of pain yeah. receptors oh, so. and it's weird when that's taken away and you're like i can i can't walk yeah like i can barely <laughs> walk it's like uh-huh. that function is gone and that's where i think that's where your brain starts freaking out it's like dude if you can't walk what are you gonna do like so absolutely uh physical therapists i i kind of say i mean what you do is like super close. I mean, it's to me, it's physical therapy, what you're doing, but you get to do that. And now there's like a blending because it's not just traditional like chiropractic that chiropractors, especially like you are doing now, like mm-hmm. you are teaching exercises before they leave. You're doing the ART, you're doing the muscle testing, you're doing all of that. Um, I go and when I shadow, same thing, mm-hmm. right? Do you shadow or have you shadowed physical therapists or has there been conversation there? Because I think there's that, it's that weird thing where like sometimes like I've I've met PTs that like look down on chiropractors. Like, Mm -hmm. have you been to the new ones now? I understand (laughs) maybe they just do that and maybe you worry about that. It's like, but it's closer to what you do here now. No, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, I I haven't, I don't know a whole lot of physical therapists here in town, um, but, you know, a lot of the techniques and the, you know, seminars that I've taken, they're usually, you know, about 50-50, Kairos and PTs. So, you know, I get a chance to meet a lot of them that way. Um, And and I thought there's a a really uh, great guy that I follow. His name's Craig Liebenson. Uh, He's a chiropractor out in California, but he's kind of one of the leaders in the what we call kind of the functional functional yeah. approach to chiropractic as opposed to purely structural. Yeah. Um, but in, he had a quote, and that was basically, if you are practicing at like the utmost of your potential, you shouldn't be able to tell whether you're a chiropractor or a physical therapist. Like, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Like it should look the same. same. But like, yeah. And so that's kind of what, what I've been trying to do basically is – if it works and it's effective, I want to learn it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, You're not boxing yourself Exactly, in. exactly. So, you know, like there's some patients that I'll, you know, adjust like one area and then the rest of it is like soft tissue work and rehab, yeah. you know? And then there's some people that, you know, the majority of what I do with them is adjusting. Yeah. Um, but, it, yeah, it's basically kind of letting the patient – dictate you know tell you what they need basically and so yeah. you want to have as many tools in your toolbox so that way you know you can kind of meet them where they're at and give them what they need yeah um but yeah i mean it, it's kind of the you know it's just like with any profession there's you know there's some chiropractors that you know practice some really old stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know they're <laughs> just kind of stuck in their rut and there's some physical therapists you know that you come in, they break out their little workbook and say, all right, plantar fasciitis, you're going to do this, 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 Yeah, and yeah, this, it's a checklist. You know? You're going to do the same thing exactly. everybody else has been doing. Um, yep. But, you know, the people who are really kind of at the forefront of each profession, you know, more and more 
a visit with, you know, a Cairo who's, yeah. you know, really at the forefront and a PT, it's probably going to look very similar. Oh, well, I've actually, a couple of people I've sent to you, it's funny because uh, one had a shoulder injury and you're like, man, I, 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 like you need to go get an MRI. I think I've kind of taken you as far as I can go. And that's what I love about you and Dr. Mike. If, if, if you get to that point, you're like, this is outside my wheelhouse, then we'll go to this next step. And you called out what he had and it turned out he did. He had, a, a, I think, a, a partially torn uh, rotator cuff mm-hmm. and another guy you're like I think you have like a bursa thing going on in your knee sure enough he went and got it checked <laughs> out and that's what it was and then that's not what it is it's that so close like it's physical therapy I mean that's what it is yeah um I see that in this industry too though just with personal training where the older school people at least in their thought pattern they might be like new to the industry in general but um, they don't do whatever the modality is, whatever the, the specific type of training is, and they'll knock it. Yeah. And I was like, have you been to like a workshop? Have you trained? Have you trained underneath somebody that does that? No. Then how do you know? <laughs> like you haven't done that thing, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing I'll see with some of the, the chiropractor I was going to where he's knocking that. I was like, but have you done? Like have you had ART done on you? Yeah. Like no, <laughs> no. I was like, dude, go try. Like, just go try. What's the worst thing that can happen, right? Yep. Yeah, they box themselves in so much, and then they just crap all over it, right? And they have no idea. So, Well, and I think, you know, the biggest, the thing that I notice about that is, you know, any of these, like, commercial models, like a certain training system or a certain, you know, soft tissue system, you know, like, they would not exist if they don't help some people, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah. so they work for some people, but I think what, what happens where people get in ruts is where they try to take, you know, that one system and make it work for everybody, Yeah. you know, and instead of, like, looking at the person and then picking which which technique which one does, or whatever yeah. would apply best for them. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's kind of, you know, it's dogma, right? And in, in, in any profession that yeah. can, you know, get you in a rut if you if you basically just hold to one thing and you're unyielding and unwilling to learn new yeah. things. One of the that's what I like about you and Dr. Mike too is like I've gone to workshops and you guys are there. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And I was like, oh the man they like it's it was cool to see uh, I can't remember if you were at the parkour workshop. I know Dr. Mike was, and I that went, threw I went me to off. One of them yeah. with, with Cameron, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and the, uh, that uh, well, no, this was the uh, this wasn't when Cameron came down. This was when uh, the parkour generation guys came down because oh, they yeah. hosted at the end, and Dr. Mike was there, and I was like, "What? Like, <laughs> all right." And he was there, and he crushed it. And then, yeah, you, I remember you at the Cameron when Cameron came down, and uh, they were kind of doing like the hybrid, like move nap parkour one. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it, I was just so impressed with the fact that you guys were at all this stuff. I can't even get my trainer friends a lot of the times to come <laughs> down and do some of those things with me. But uh, it was cool to see you guys down there just to be open to it and see what your own personal practice is. Mm-hmm. I, like, I know Dr. Uh, Mike does all the acro yoga. Yeah. Which he tried to get me out there. I was like, no, I'm not, with these shoulders. <laughs> not with these shoulders. I watch. I'll watch you guys at the park. <laughs> like I've seen them <laughs> down there before. Uh, and then he'll randomly, I'll bump into, we went to... Uh, what, Conquer Fitness or something like that? It basically, they're turning into like a Ninja Warrior gym. Oh, yeah. The and I called yeah. it. I was like, I bet I see him down there. <laughs> and he was down there. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> he yeah. was there. Yeah, him and Lindsay yeah. were there. Uh, when you look at that stuff, what kind of draws your attention to the, what you're going to pick, whether it's a certification or a workshop or something like that? Um, You know, for me, uh, lately... Lately, I've just been kind of wanting to just kind of broaden my horizons of, like, what's out there. Yeah. Um, so I kind of really got into kettlebells yeah. um, and kind of functional training. Um, and so, like, you know, the parkour stuff, you know, that was interested me. Um, you know, basically, I just want to kind of find lots of different ways to move and lots yeah. of different ways to be strong. <laughs> Um, so, you know, like kettlebells, parkour, uh, you know, any kind of body weight stuff, even CrossFit, you know, basically anything that is, you know, going to kind of test me in a different way. So that's kind of what I've been interested in. Yeah. And we're move- we are moving away from that notion of like, well, I only bodybuild yeah. or I only do powerlifting yeah. or whatever it is. Like now it's, it's a mixture mm-hmm. like, and they all impact like just my own personal practice. And I see this with yours cause you, and especially since you've been talking about it now, but like 
my the move nat cert that I have affects my medical exercise because mm-hmm. I use that and it integrates into how I, I deal with balance yep with that um, and just like the parkour setup one of the greatest takeaways from that I'm so glad I did that was how you coach mm-hmm. like they gave you the structure because it was a coaching certification yep They're, they expected you to know the movements they mm-hmm. were like how do you coach <laughs> that was really really cool yeah I mean that that was probably the most the biggest rude awakening for me when I started practicing was yeah. like when I'd get a client down on the ground and I'd tell them to like activate a certain muscle or like, you know, do a posterior pelvic tilt or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And they just looked at me like, what? Like, yeah, yeah. And I remember like, wait, I know the exercise. So I should, they should be able to just do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I had to learn, wait, no, I have to be able to communicate that to them in a, in a language that they understand and, yeah. and not just the way that it makes sense to me. So yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot, you know, like Aaron Balch, uh, when, when I started kind of going to some of his stuff, that was a lot of what I learned was just kind of listening to the way that he communicated things to people. Like That dude's a freaking encyclopedia yeah. of information. It's insane. Uh, Zach <laughs> talked about that, and we're going to talk about Zach here in a minute. But uh, <laughs> one of the things I've noticed with trainers around town, and it, I think it's a newer trend, is um, an overuse of complicated terminology yeah. to seem smarter. Yeah. And even I, I, I personally, I noticed I started doing it first and then I started noticing like there was a disconnect. It was like, this doesn't get my point across. Mm-hmm. Explain it in how they can, in a, in a language they can understand and then layer it on a little bit at a time, especially yeah. since I see my clients repetitively. And then eventually they'll understand what you're talking about. If you just do it slower as a person, like, all right, we're going to do this anterior we you have an anterior pelvic tilt yeah. and your ribs are flaring because there's no articulation in this and you're like laying on there and they're looking Let's at do you like I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pattern, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what uh, me and you have talked about it. Functional patterns. Um Nadi's calmed down with just attacking everybody. Uh, if you haven't looked up functional patterns, look them up online. Uh, I think it's super interesting stuff what they're doing. I was fortunate enough to go out to the gym and train. But the overuse that I've noticed that he does with his terminology and it's like, man, if, if you don't know any of this, you're looking at it, you're like, I will never touch that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's too complicated for me. It's not for the everyday person. Yeah. No, um, I mean, I remember in school, you know, we had to learn medical terminology and, you know, all the different planes of motion and yeah. all, all those types of terms. And then I remember about halfway, you know, towards the end of school, there was a teacher who was like, all right, so now you guys know all these words. And now you need. Now you're about to start working with patients, so you need to forget those words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and now you need to start talking like a normal person. Right? <laughs> They'll get lost in the weeds real exactly, quick. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, most of the time. If, if they don't understand them, then you're not communicating effectively. So you're not even going to look smart because they, yeah, they don't you're even talking know gibberish. what you're saying. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Zach, we've had him and Carmen on that. You guys put on a workshop. You've created a kind of a self-testing system. How would you describe this? So it's basically a, a self movement screen or a self mobility screen. So it's kind of a way for a person on their own to be able to do a little screen, a a movement, and it will tell them whether or not they are tight or stiff or are lacking a range of motion in a certain area. And so, you know, what we wanted to do was kind of, you know, I would have a lot of patients that like I was talking about who, you know, maybe they had a tight shoulder we would loosen it back up and they would come back in the next visit and it would be tight again. Yeah. And so I wanted to kind of show them like, okay, this is what you should be able to do. Yeah. So each day you need to kind of check this. And if you're starting to lose it, then you need to, you know, get down and do these exercises that we're giving you at home. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was just kind of like, you know, there's a lot of problems that if you just cleaned up your mobility, I would never need to see you. you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like, yeah. like most of the time, you know, most of the, the ways that I approach uh, assessing a patient is, you know, looking at where they hurt and then looking above and below that area and looking to see, do they have normal range of motion? And yeah. if they don't, that's where I attack. So, you know, being able to let people do that at home will let them need me less and less. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, So that was kind of what we wanted to do was to show people, A, you know, mobility matters, how to check their own mobility. And then what we do after we teach the screens is we kind of show them some of the, 
you know, some ways to help open those Like up. the correctives almost to, exactly. to open it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Zach worked for you guys for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, with that, what was that kind of the conversation around that? Because I remember around the time the posts, they started seeing some videos from you guys. <laughs> And Zach, I mean, Zach's always hungry for knowledge, and he was geeking out because you guys were literally, I'm assuming, just kind of sitting there talking about movement yeah. in between on the breaks, and then slowly, is that what kind of, this came out of those conversations? Yeah, so, I mean, we're kind of interested in a lot of the same stuff, and what what I always kind of mm-hmm. noticed with Zach, especially when we worked together, was that, like, I had an idea, or, you know, like, I had a concept that I wanted to get across to a patient, and it just wasn't happening. Yeah. <laughs> and then Zach could step in and get creative and create what I was wanting to see using words I'd never, you know, using yeah, yeah, yeah. images and instructions that I never would have thought, thought of. about. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I kind of saw how, you know, he, his creativity and, and his thirst for knowledge. And yeah. that was, and so, you know, I really enjoy, like, if, if I know something and you're interested in it, I want to teach it to you. Like, yeah. I, I like to share yeah, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, so we, uh, that's kind of how we clicked. And so, and then we started talking about, you know, what types of seminars that we like, you know, what, what could we do? What could we offer to, yeah. to the community? And so that was when. And now you guys want to take this to gyms and kind of teach that so that people there can do that before they hurt themselves, yeah. which yeah. gyms don't offer any of that, which they should. They yeah. Should. Well, and, and that, the big thing that really kind of influenced all of this was, uh, when I interned up in St. Louis, the guy who owned the gym, he has a company called Smart Group Fitness. Yeah. Um, and what he did is he created a, a system where you use FMS screens on all of your group fitness clients. Yeah. And then what you do is like any of the screens that they fail, if they have pain in or if they you know have unacceptable ranges of motion or whatever, he, he developed this little system where they would have a different colored bracelet. Like if they had they were a one or a zero on the shoulder mobility they'd get a black bracelet and then what he would do is during the group fitness class you know like if the next exercise was overhead presses and you had you know a a a bad score on your shoulder mobility yeah then instead of doing overhead presses you were foam rolling your t-spine and so it was just like and i remember watching that and seeing like how seamlessly they would you know the different groups they could integrate all that and and I just remember being like, man, like if more gyms, if more people just even knew that they needed to be working on yeah. that, like it could totally, totally help people. So that's kind of what we wanted to create is yeah. something where, you know, if, if you have horrible shoulder mobility and you love to go military press at the gym, like you, you need to either, either just know that you're making a bad decision. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of times people just don't even understand that the reason why, you know, their low back hurts when they press yeah. overhead is because they have so much stiffness in their, their shoulders, shoulders and yeah, they're back. loading their back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Zach had an example where he said like the, we have like almost like hypermobile lower backs, really rigid upper backs, and then like hypermobile necks almost. And he said mm-hmm. we should kind of like be reversing some of those things, because now we're and I always use it because I, I stole that from him. And I, but I use it as like it's like you're a bobblehead, mm-hmm. you're teetering off your lower back, and you're just like swaying this way because this is so stiff it won't react, it won't move, and uh, you're creating problems for your lower back. So when yeah. you're lifting something and doing these other things, and you think, yeah, you're doing a shoulder press. No, dude, you're just loading your lower back. And we <laughs> yeah. talk about the rib flare and all that. Mm-hmm. I've noticed the other thing in the industry, though, is uh, somebody watching something quickly in passing, like a YouTube video, or you showed me once kind of in passing, and then now I know it. Mm-hmm. So now I can go do it on everybody, and I'm going to do this. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you might want to contemplate that a little bit longer my friend (laughs) uh because i think i've seen that where it was to the detriment of either their own personal fitness because they watch a youtube video and they hurt themselves and i've gotten clients like that they're like i was doing this person's video or this person's program like by yourself (laughs) like you didn't have anybody else helping you right Uh or it's it's a trainer that's trying to do it um and I, i usually don't understand that maybe they don't want their client to think that they don't have the widespread knowledge or whatever they want to mix it up but sometimes it's just that they had that base knowledge on what it was with that they they could avoid hurting somebody yep right yep. um do you get people that come in and, and they almost like refuse to do the correctives or are they pretty open to all that stuff 
Uh, you know, it's it's kind of a mixture. Um, you know, sadly, like like what you're talking about, that there's kind of like a there. You know, there's some people that literally they don't really know anything about how their body's supposed to move. Yeah, they'll listen. You know, whatever you tell them, they're like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, then it's like there, there's like a and then there's people who you know maybe they're a trainer or a PT or a doctor or something and so they know a lot of stuff and then so then at least what I say makes sense and they're, yeah. and they're likely to kind of do it understand why I'm telling them to do what I do and then there's kind of like a group right in the middle that they, they know just enough to yeah. be dangerous <laughs> and they, they've seen just enough YouTube yeah. videos to think that they know you know kind of what, what they should be doing. Yeah. Um, and you know, I thought Charlie Weingroff put that really well. And he was like, you know, would you go to your car mechanic? And he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to, it's your alternator. And you'd say, no, I think it's a transmission. You should fix that now. You know, there's just some people that they're just not going to listen to you. So yeah. uh, my, my response is always like, you know, you came to me for my, yeah. my experience, <laughs> I'm trying my to expertise. Help you, man. <laughs> I can, I can tell you what I think you need to do and it's your call. Yeah. Whether, yeah, whether yeah. You do it yeah, or yeah. And I love, uh, the, I've had the clients, I'm sure you've had the patients, I've seen the trainers like this too, where um, they already know ahead of time. So they almost start to try to explain to you yeah. what this is. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa let me, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, I think what, what I find interesting about that is I'm horrible about that. Like if yeah. something's going on with me, I like I already know the diagnosis before I get there. And every time that's ever happened, when I go and I see somebody for it, it's not what I thought it yeah, was. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> so, you know, there's a certain amount of, you know, you want to, they're, you know, the, that person is the only person who experiences their body. So yeah. you want to kind of listen to them yeah. to a certain extent, but then you want to, you know, just do your assessment and kind of see what you find. So Well, I usually try to do that as much as I can because I, I don't want to be that when I go see you guys too because yeah. you do, you do the corrective asteroids. And the, mo- the furthest I'll go is like, oh, we kind of do that with like medical exercise. And then from there, I try to, if I can, just shut up, get out of the way, right? And then and then learn maybe a little bit of a tidbit that I didn't understand or I didn't know that you have figured out or anybody. Because right now, uh, who do you have up front? You have Lindsay, because we've had Lindsay on the podcast. Okay. Carmen was there. We've had Carmen and Zach on the podcast at the same time. Is that only... So right now, it's just, it's Lindsay and a guy named Jake, Jake Mathis. Have you met him yet? Well, we're not, we're good friends. Well, we're not, <laughs> well, I mean, we're friends. We're not, we were really close there for a while, and then he left to Oregon. He's come back. I actually haven't seen him, and every time I come, I'm like, oh, I'm going to see Jake, and then he's not there, but he's about to leave again. Yeah, right? he's about to he's go. He's about to go, yeah. He's going to have to go work on some fishing boat in Alaska. <laughs> really? Yeah. My cousin's so done that. That's rough definitely work, Definitely doing an interesting adventure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I just try to get out of the way. Um, and I think me and you've talked about this too. Some people don't want to do workshops or certs. Mm-hmm. And I, I say, I make it a point to do that because I think it immediately gets me put right back in my place. Mm-hmm. I don't want my head to get inflated. So I go there and I think one thing and they're like, duh, duh, and they, they've been practicing for a long time, 15, 20 years, some of these people, and they have an extreme amount of knowledge and they'll show you and then immediately like I get knocked down a peg. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got to start from scratch. I got to, I got to start all over again. That's why I like going and talking with Aaron too. When we go out there to just to train, just to like catch some info, knocking off this guy as, as he's talking about a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, what are some of your favorite like workshops or certs that you've done? And before that, did you go do the one with Ito? No, I okay. didn't do that. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Mike did. Yeah. Um, so I would say probably my favorite certs so far would probably have to be SFMA and DNS. So <clears throat> SFMA, that's uh, basically like the medical side of the FMS yeah. group. Um, and so that one was really, it was just really mind-blowing just because it was we got into a lot of like how to differentiate like problems that people are having yeah. between like mobility, stability problems. Um, and you know, there's, it, it was just a lot of information that really kind of opened me up and showed me like where I was maybe looking at some things that I thought were mobility problems, but they actually turned out to be stability problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it really kind of helped me to be able to kind of look at a patient in a different way and yeah. kind of categorize them in a, in a better, you know, to, so I could help them quicker. Yeah. Kind of helped me 
you know, they call it being a sniper, right? Like yeah, one yeah. shot, one kill, instead yeah, yeah. of just throwing everything at them <laughs> and seeing what sticks. Shotgun approach. <laughs> um, so that one was was really, uh, a, I really enjoyed it. And then the other one was DNS. So that is the... Which you told me, they're coming in September. I'm looking at that one. Because yeah. um, I took a year off from certs after I got the, the MES, the Medical Exercise Specialist one. But I'd done like five to 10 workshops and I've gone and trained with other people, but I, you start to get that. I need like a workshop. I want three days immersed in something. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, they're coming to Tulsa for that. Can you explain what that is a little bit more? So basically DNS was developed by a guy in uh, Prague in the Czech Republic. Um, so he uh, worked a lot with uh, like children with cerebral palsy. Yeah. So a lot of the stuff at first was, it was developed as a way to help people with neurological injuries, right? So um, what, it, what it really does, fundamentally, what it does is it looks at, you know, we're one of the few mammals that comes out of the womb and we can't walk, yeah. right? Like most, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, you know, giraffes and, and horses, I think. Postnatal development. <laughs> yeah, they basically, we, yeah. They, they come out of the womb, they get up and they walk around, right? Yeah, yeah. So we, the way that we learn how to control our bodies happens in a very, in an ordered process, right? Like yeah. there's certain milestones that we hit pretty consistently at certain ages and we learn how to do different things. And if we don't hit them, then that usually that indicates we have some kind of problem. Yeah. Um, and so what, what it does is it kind of goes back through and it looks at, you know, now when someone comes in with a, you know, a, a really bad low back, then what, what, what it does is it kind of puts them back in those developmental positions and looks at like, you know, what have you lost? Like, can you do what you should have been able to do at three months? Okay. Yeah, you can. What about six months? Oh, well, now you, you got some problems. Can you there. give like an example of what something like that might be? So like, um, so the three month position, basically at, at three months, you should be able to lay on your back, lift your legs up and control your trunk, right? Like, yeah. When you do that, your back shouldn't arch up. You yeah. shouldn't have to like, lift spine. your head. Yeah. Exactly. And then at six months, you start to get to be where you could bring your knees a little higher up yeah. over your trunk and start to roll a little bit. Okay. So it, it basically, um, what, what he talks about is what he calls the deep spine stabilization system. So that's kind of like you'll hear people talk about your deep core and that includes basically all the muscles that hold your spine in a neutral position. Yeah. And so what the system is based around evaluating people's abilities to stabilize their spine. And I think what was really kind of mind-blowing for me with that course was he talks about anytime you have a muscle that works, you have to have what's called a punctum fixum. And a punctum, I think it was locum or move, movement. I forget, yeah. I forget what it yeah. is. But basically, all muscles have to have a fixed point and a moving point in order to create actions. And so he was talking about, you know, like if your core is not engaged, if you can't stabilize your trunk and you have a shoulder problem, well, your serratus anterior muscle attaches, it goes from your shoulder blade to your rib cage. And so you're never going to be able to properly activate that serratus if you have a rib flare. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so it really kind of breaks down into if your center is messed up, yeah, yeah. you, you can't fix anything yeah. on, the, on the periphery. On the, yeah. So it, you know, it kind of goes back to that stuff Greg Cook talks about, which is like you have to have proximal stability in order to have distal mobility. So yeah. you, if you can't control your core, you're going to have stiff hips and stiff shoulders and all that kind of stuff, because that's your body's yeah. way of trying to find stability somewhere. Well, my favorite, uh, I always quote him on, uh, uh, we never uh, layer like or, or add load on top of dysfunction. Yeah, I love that one, because I, I always do just a flat-footed squat. Can you just squat into a seated yeah. position? If you can't get there, why should we load your back with hundreds of pounds of weight? Um, and I love the MoveNet system where we talk about people are effective, but they're not efficient. We're yeah. aiming for that efficiency. I was like, dude, you can lift it. I can see you can lift it. Cool. Yeah. But at the cost of your body, yeah. like, <laughs> when you're older, what's going to be going on, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> After you yeah. do this for so long. Well, and, and my yeah. favorite is the people who, you know, they can, you know, lift a really heavy weight, like in a bicep curl. 
but you know they do it at like 70 miles per hour and, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. like, i remember the first trainer i ever worked with who did fms uh, he had a great saying and that was speed hides dysfunction <laughs> yeah we say uh, speed hides inefficiencies yeah um and I tell my clients, like, that is one of the things from the MoveNet system I quote the most. Because the second we get them on a balance beam, they run across it. Yeah. I was like, whoa, 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 come back here. <laughs> and we go slow, and they have no trunk stability, yep. and their hips are all wonky. So they're literally just falling off real quick. I was like, you went fast because your body's trying yeah. to mask that, right? <laughs> and I tell them all the time, clients all the time, I was like, your body's smart. It's going to yeah. do whatever you tell it to do at the detriment of itself if it has to, yep. right? But you're just not paying attention to what the signals are. Right, you shouldn't have to arch your lower back to curl a weight up. Yeah, like, what good exactly. is that doing? You, right, <laughs> same thing with an overhead press. Yeah. So, uh, we're actually starting to wind down a little bit. As we start to wind down with this, we start to do kind of like rapid fire questions. We say that they can be a long answer; they're just like our <laughs> end of the conversation questions. Um, so, uh, kind of had one with the what's your favorite kind of workshop or cert? What's your favorite person in the industry right now? Um. I'd probably have to say Charlie Weingroff. Yeah. Why, uh, why, why Charlie Weingroff? I really like his stuff. He's just kind of like no nonsense. Like yeah. he, he's not going to get behind like any woo or yeah. any like whatever the trend is. Like he's just, uh, you know, he's just a really, really, really strong guy who likes to learn. <laughs> Does he have like a, his own teaching system or modality or anything like that or no so no i mean he has like a, a workshop that he does yeah. that training equals rehab or t equals r yeah and I, I think he's on like you know there was like t equals r t equals r2 and now i think he's even on like three but he's like you know he's kind of where i want to be um basically he uh he uses a lot of fms and sfma now he's into dns a lot yeah um and then he uses like hardcore you know barbell trading like, yeah yeah so, yeah, yeah you know like I, I think my end goal would be to you know have somebody that you know came in and saw me and i you know adjusted their low back did some you know art releases did some dns exercises and then they deadlifted 300 pounds yeah, as part right. of their yeah. rehab. You know, Boom, like, done. Yeah. I think that's you yeah. know, where you're really going to make huge changes in people. I think the industry is changing, too, just in general. I mean, and I'm thankful because you start to see, like, oh, other people are doing, whether that's move NAD or, or they're starting to use some type of rehab or they're doing soft tissue work now, and then they're still lifting. Yeah. Like normal, like I, I hate when I see in the industry where it's an end all be all, where it's like, no, you do this or you do nothing else because yeah. yeah. our way is the only way. It's like for real, like <laughs> you have, like you know all of it, right? Yep, you know exactly. exactly how the body moves. <laughs> no, uh, so uh, if you could train with anybody in the industry, would it be him? Yeah, it would probably be him or there's a doc that I really admire. He's actually coming to teach that DNS course oh, here yeah, in Tulsa. Yeah, yeah. His yeah. name's Brett Winchester. Yeah. But he's uh, he's kind of like my uh, chiropractic rock star. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he was, I got uh, his trading cards. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he, he taught at, at the school I went to, and he also taught for a uh, a technique system that I learned. It's called motion palpation. It's an adjusting technique. Yeah. Uh, but now he also teaches for DNS. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, he he's the the DNS practitioner for the Cardinals. Really? Um, yeah. So he's That's crazy. yeah, and and that was actually what first got me interested in DNS was when I was in school. I went and I shadowed him. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was really into ART at the time, and he had this patient, you know, a woman like a real kind of type A, yeah. real high stress, real tight upper shoulders. And he said, you know, he had me come over and feel her shoulder muscles, you know, and they were like solid as a rock. And then he did some DNS work with her, working on breathing, getting her to use her her diaphragm instead yeah. of her shoulders. And then he said, all right, now come feel her neck again. And it was like butter. Really? <laughs> and I just remember being yeah. like, you know, I would have spent yeah, 15 so minutes, <laughs> you know, really digging in there, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I was like, I was like, that's. You're like a wizard, basically. <laughs> Just breathe. Yeah, Just exactly. Breathe. <laughs> uh, favorite movement, like exercise movement, whatever. Favorite movement that just comes to mind? Um, I would say probably uh, the swing. The kettlebell that, swing? Yeah, that, yeah, that's the one where, like, when when I get that properly executed, like, I feel like I'm in beast mode, basically. Yeah, like yeah, it, yeah. It, it, When you really get every all the points connected it's on that, juggling you feel a lot, really man. strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used the example. I saw a video of one of the uh, uh, 
top teachers in Strong First, where he's holding the kettlebell. And he goes, people are they're doing the hinge before. He goes, you wait till this weight gets to your lap, and that's it pushes your hips back. Yeah, it forces that. He goes, so everybody hold on to your kettlebell. He goes, raise that up, and they start to lift it up, and everybody gets X amount of feet from their body. And he goes, where do you feel that? And he goes, everybody's like my lower back yeah. and my shoulders. He goes, right, your lower back because the weight is literally trying to go straight down to the floor, and your back has to counter that. He goes, yep. you are swinging like that <laughs> because you're literally trying to basically start the swing way before yeah it's all back um but rkc and strong first i know carmen has both i think of her certs and that she does yeah Mm -hmm. like that's like anybody that has it i just thumbs up to you because that's ridiculous (laughs) that's one of those certs i'd love to do but i can't because my shoulders because they do the snatch yeah and i'm like nope good i'm not going to dislocate my too many ripped up hands i mean (laughs) i I actually have kind of a weird thought that i might try that sometime but it's years down the road yeah yeah, yeah. (laughs) i have a lot of work to do before i'm ready for that uh favorite uh book it doesn't have to be in the industry just favorite like book my favorite book of all time is Ender's Game. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, I watched but, the movie. I didn't read the book. That was good. That was good. So you got to read the book. <laughs> the now, movie but was I've talked a to some people. Letdown. Well, I've <laughs> talked to some people though, and they're like, "Dude, like, because it's multi. It has a whole bunch." Yeah. It? Now it's got like it's you know, ridiculous prequels, sequels, like all all kinds. They were trying of stuff. to explain the notion of it, and I was like, "That sounds like one of those things. Like that should have been like six movies because yeah. it's too grand of a scale." Yeah. Right, yeah, where they try and like speed through it to the very end <laughs> in the movie, right? Yeah, yeah, no, but that was in in eighth grade. I had like I was in like a, a gifted and talented class, yeah. and so we had the teacher was like you know really kind of crunchy hippie kind of yeah, yeah. lady, <laughs> uh, but so she had us read like a lot of really different things, and so that was a book that we got assigned to read. When did that come grade. out? Because that is an older book series, is it not? Yeah, I think it came out in like the late eighties or early nineties. Yeah, because randomly I actually heard that. Marine Corps, uh, uh, what do you call them? Officers. Yeah, they read that as really? part of their training. Yeah, really, really interesting. That's crazy. <laughs> but they, uh, but she assigned that as a book we had to read and write a report on, and that was the very first book I ever read because I enjoyed it. <laughs> really, <laughs> and so that, yeah. and then I just kind of got stuck on that. Yeah. So I remember the first one. I, I we went to go see. Mine was Lord of the Rings. We went to go see the first one, and I was like, it just blew me away. Yeah. And so I went home. I got. Uh, two Towers, and I read it in like three days, and I'm like, I don't... It's a beef cake yeah, of a book there. I don't read books like that, and I just blew through it, and I was like, I don't know, well, now I need the Return of the King. And I read yeah. that, and it's like, well, now I need, the, like, where's the, the Hobbit? All right, reading The Hobbit. All right, now I need... Uh, my favorite one, though, then they'll never make a movie out of it, at least in my lifetime, was The Cimmeralian, which is like the backstory of all of it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I've heard of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, That one <laughs> tells you, like, the gods that were basically got cast out of heaven that yeah. became like this and then the, all that. It's super cool. <laughs> um, but uh, is there a favorite uh, book that you've actually like gifted to somebody that you give out or that you recommend? Maybe even to people in the industry where you're like, dude, you got to read this book. Um, you know, I think the probably the book that fits that would be Explain Pain. Who's that from? Um, I, I forget. Is it Lorimer Mosley, I believe? Or maybe it's David Butler. I'm forgetting right okay. now. They, they both have written books on pain. But yeah. it, it's a it's a, a must read if yeah. you work with people in pain. Like, yeah. Because uh, it, it really goes into like all the research into pain science and yeah. like, how we experience pain and how we can modulate pain. Yeah. It's a really good book. Have, okay. you, have you ever read it? No, I haven't. Okay. No, you know, I gotta, man, I'm we'll reading to to Katie you. Bowman's foot book right now. I nice. just got one from... Is it Miko, whoever, like he's a, uh, he's a physicist. I got his book. And then I have two other books that I'm halfway through done. And I keep layering on these books. I, need. <laughs> I was like, I need to finish my book. And yeah. then I need to read, <laughs> finish reading these books. I need to get them done. Are you going to, uh, people won't care about this, but next week um, at D at uh, uh, Mindful Body Fitness, Tim with Restorative Exercise is coming down. Are you going to be going to that at all? Uh, I don't think so. The, uh, let's see, what days? Is it Friday so, and Saturday? Um, I think it might be next week already, but I'm going to a seminar up in Denver oh, yeah? on the 20th and 21st. What are you going for? Uh, so it's called GRIP. It's called yeah. The GRIP Approach. Um, so uh, it's by a guy named Benjamin Fergus. He's a chiropractor. Um, and he's done like a ton of training in DNS and a lot of other kind of uh, Czechoslovakian-based yeah. rehab systems. Uh, and so like one of the things about DNS is I really like it. But it's really kind of like esoteric. Like it's 
you're really kind of looking at like the person as a whole. Yeah. And then that kind of makes it hard for like an individual patient, like how, what's the best way to apply it to yeah, them. Yeah. Um, and so it kind of looks like what, what this guy, Dr. Fergus has done is he's kind of broken it down into like little assessments, almost like movement screens. Yeah. And then shows like, all right, if somebody can't do this, this is the developmental position you need to put them in okay. in the exercise. So yeah. it's it's kind of a it looks like a really great way to kind of bring it all together. Yeah, bring it all together yeah. and make it kind of easier to use. Uh, last three questions. Um, a movement because we we asked this with Doctor Mike, like something everybody should do, and he gave us cat cow. And we go, why? He goes, because it fixes the most, like, what we can get it right. Do you have something like that? What's something, like, everybody should do? Um, so I would say, if we're talking about everybody, um, hmm, that's a good one. Or if, it, if you can't think of one like that, maybe, like, one of that, it's, like, the most common thing you see. If people would just fix this and you could do this to help it. Yeah, so I, I would say then probably the shin box. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the most common things, because we all sit so much, yeah. is our hips tighten up. Yeah. Um, and so if people, you know, so many people with low back pain wouldn't have low back pain if they didn't have tight hips. Tight hips. Yeah. yeah. Um, or knee pain or ankle pain. So probably yeah, yeah, yeah. the shin box or, you know, some other form of, form of a hip form mobility. Of yeah, yeah. But I'd say the shin box, especially if you do the raise at the end where you kind of raise up onto the knees. Yeah, yeah. And then it almost becomes like a hip flexor stretch yeah, as well. Then, yeah. then it almost hits every box there is for, you know, hip complaints. So yeah. that's probably the one I'd recommend. And uh, if we can't put a video in there, you guys just look it up on YouTube. You'll find one. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the ways we use uh, to get up off the floor without using our hands and the yep. move mat system. Okay, uh, zombie apocalypse. You get to bring one item. It can be anything. With you, what is it? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, after watching Walking Dead, <laughs> I'd probably have to say a crossbow. Crossbow. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> just... the, the you don't you know the ammunition. If you can't find black yeah. powder yeah. or whatever, you can always find a stick and maybe yeah. cut it into our, the shape our answers there. get like outlanded. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Zach said friendship. Uh, <laughs> he said that in like, cheese whiz. <laughs> sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we started getting like, well, I'm going to bring a transformer. Well, I'm bringing the Death Star, or I'm bringing uh, bringing a Terminator, or. Uh, uh, I'm just going to bring, uh, is it Daryl? I'm going to bring Daryl yeah, with his exactly. crossbow. He's going to be my bodyguard. Uh-huh. Yeah. And his bike. <laughs> right. Uh, last one is a health-related question that we always ask. How many times a day do you go number two? Uh, probably anywhere between three and four. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I go, it depends, like three to six. Sometimes if my stomach's off, like it changes. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, something's wrong. Right. People are like, that's like so much. It's like, no, you shouldn't just go once, dude. That's not good. You need to go yeah. more than just once. Well, right? I, I remember in school, I, it was fascinating to find out that there's actually a reflex in our body that when we eat food and it enters the stomach, that it starts a chain reaction that within about 15 to 20 minutes, you should have a bowel movement. I tell people that all the time, and they're yeah. like, no, that's not. It's like, no, 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 we learned that in school. Like, mm-hmm. that's legit. Every time after a major meal, you should then go to the bathroom. Yep, gastrocolic <laughs> reflex. There we go. Called. Now we yep. have a name for it, right, because I forgot it. So uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I'm going to put a link for Zoba. I'm assuming that's where you want to direct everybody, the Facebook Absolutely. page. Does Zoba have a Yeah, we have Instagram? a website. Well, you have a website, but do you have an Instagram? Uh Uh-huh, yeah, Zova Body. Okay, so I'm going to try and make sure we get all those links in the show notes. And uh, we're actually going to take you upstairs for a minute, show you some VR stuff so you can experience (laughs) that also. Hopefully I won't follow. Right? (laughs) We'll get some video of it if you do. So thanks for listening, guys. Thank you so much for doing this with us. And then uh, until next time, guys, uh, check back with us later. We want to thank you for listening to this episode of Local A-List. And as always, we want to thank our guests for stopping by and sharing their time with us. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed what you heard, please go to iTunes and leave us a rating or a review. This really helps us out. And as always, we are looking for sponsors, uh, preferably locally, but we will accept national sponsors as well. Contact us through localalist.com. And you can check us out at facebook.com forward slash local a list. Um, my personal website is jamespesh.com. And mine is Stephen Morales, cpt.com. Check back with us next week for another episode. Mm-hmm.